struggling to move your nonprofit forward? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Nonprofit Architect, where we are giving you the actionable steps you need to launch and grow your nonprofit organization. Now, here's your host, Travis Johnson. Well, this is Travis Johnson, the Nonprofit Architect, coming to you pre recorded from my house. I am back in the U.S., excited to be here, first time recording in my bedroom. So I don't know if you can hear the fan in the background. I don't know if the dogs are going to bark. Uh, it's going to be one of those crazy episodes where anything can happen. I'm here today with Vincent James, just outside of the Philadelphia area. He runs Keep Music Alive. Vincent, how are you doing today? Very good, Travis. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm uh, surprisingly not too jet lagged. I just flew back from <laughs> Bahrain. It was a short uh, eight airports and six flights from Bahrain to Italy to Spain to the U.S., from Virginia to Detroit, <laughs> to Minneapolis, to Oklahoma City. Real now that's east to west, the west, right? The bus stop and, <laughs> and everything else. Well, here we are live. Well, not live, pre-recorded. Hey, if you're listening to this, hop over to facebook.com slash group slash nonprofit architect. Find people just like you who are trying to figure this stuff out and uh, help us all make a, a stronger nonprofit. Vincent, why don't you give us a rundown of Keep Music Alive, why you did it, what it is, and some of the programs you run. Flash back six years ago, May 2014, I was listening to a webinar. No, I'm, I'll take it back, a teleseminar. And I'm on the phone listening to a teleseminar that I signed up for. And, you know, occasionally I like to reach out and learn new things from other people. And uh, I kept seeing this thing pop up in my inbox every once in a while called how everyone has a book inside them they need to write. And honestly, I never thought I would ever write a book. You know, what would I have to say in a book that anybody else would care to read? <laughs> I just couldn't think of anything. But something was calling me that day to listen to the teleseminar. So uh, I'm a just a little bit of background. I'm a lifetime musician. I played, you know, trombone, piano, guitar. I was in all the bands all through high school, state, uh, dance band, concert band, marching band, wrote songs, was in ro local rock bands. Music was in my blood. But as far as writing a book, I got nothing. Nothing. It's not good enough that anyone's going to want to read it. So, but I, you know, I sign up for the tell seminar. I listen to it and I'm listening along. And then all of a sudden, my God, it was like a bolt of lightning from the sky down to my head. What about a book of inspirational music stories that come from other people? And we could edit that book, you know, edit the stories, put them in the book and share it to encourage more people to want to play music. My God, it was like a... It was, and I, I ran up the stairs to my wife. I'm like, Joanne, 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 we, we got to do this. And, you know, and she's like, for slow down. <laughs> it was just a little too fast. So this is where this whole thing started. We put together a book called 88 Plus Ways Music Can Change Your Life. And we reached out to over 6,000 musicians around the world both regular musicians uh, like myself and celebrity musicians asking if they would like to contribute a story or a quote to the book. Uh, and through a year's time, we went from concept to publishing in exactly one year, June 1st, 2015, uh, when the, the book came out. And that was kind of how this whole music education advocacy started with me because, you know, all my life, you know, although I have a technical job on the side, music has been my, you know, my passion. Uh, I wanted to go to school, college for music, but, you know, my parents had steered me, you know, try to do something a little more practical. So engineering it was, and that's paid the bills. I'm very happy and grateful for that. Uh, but inside me, I always had this thing nagging, you know, I need to do something more, something different. And I did a lot of music things over the years. I, I wrote songs, I managed bands, I helped in recording studios. Uh, I wrote custom songs for people, you know, for weddings and anniversaries. But it always seemed like I was doing stuff about me, not something for society. Uh, but when I was on that call and had the idea of writing an inspirational book about music stories to share with other people, that's when it kind of all gelled together in my mind. So we put together the book and I got this crazy idea one day, you know, there should really be a week where musicians and music schools everywhere offer to teach free lessons to new students. Uh, let's call it back then. I decided let's call it teach music America. You know, I was thinking very small minded, you know, as we often do when we're starting out. 
so I just put a couple of posts out on social media, you know, Hey, you know, all my musician friends, you know, how about you know, find someone today, a friend, a family member, whoever, and sit down with them with your guitar, your keyboard, your trombone, whatever it is, saxophone, and show them a couple of things. You know, you, we all have somebody who's been talking to us, you know, in our life that, you know, would like to play music. Well, this is a week where we make the time, dedicate and get with that person and, and start the process and I'll try to light the spark so they'll want to continue playing music uh, so we put that out there not a whole lot happened that first year as these things are right <laughs> start out slow uh, by the next year I was reaching out to music schools uh, four years later after that earlier this year in March we celebrated the fifth annual teach music week and partnered with over 750 music schools in over a dozen countries to offer free lessons to new students that's how that came to be. And then that's awesome. Probably, thank you. Thank you. And then shortly after we had the idea for teach music week, which is now what it's called teach music week. It's the world people. <laughs> uh, we ran into a gal who created something called kids yoga day. And, you know, my creative mind, I'm thinking, Hmm, kids yoga day. That's really cool. I wonder if there's a kids music day. So, you know, I'm computer, to our Google friend, no, it's not there. So, bang, we started it. Uh, you know, reserve the URL, and uh, this October we will now celebrate the fifth annual Kids Music Day, and we partner with many of those same music schools, music stores, and other music nonprofits, uh, where we encourage them to hold special events that either benefit or celebrate kids playing music. It could be instrument petting zoos student performances in, in-house or out in the community, instrument donation drives, open mics for kids, uh, ukulele uh, circles, drum circles, even kids' music day sales on you know instruments or accessories, anything that helps us amplify the message of how important music is, which then allows us to go to the media you know, now twice a year for Teach Music Week in March and Kids Music Day in October and rally the media behind how important music education is for kids which is our whole why, why we're doing this. That, so is, that, is, that is really cool. And I, I just want to say that, you know, if you're listening to this and you're running a nonprofit, you can have an insert your cause week and your cause day and have dedicated twice a year where uh, the media has a reason to talk to you and give you free media coverage about the thing that you're passionate for. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know what, even if, you know, say it already existed, if Kids Music Day already existed, we would have latched onto it, helped to support it and become involved in that whole movement. To me, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It matters that we're supporting the cause. Uh, there's another holiday called Make Music Day in June on the summer solstice, June 21st. And this has been going on since 1982 in France. It started as Fête de la Musique de la Musique. I'm going to work on my French accent. It's a little troubling. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they encourage musicians of all levels, all ages, and all styles to uh, put on public performances of music. And now there's like a thousand cities in 120 countries that participate and make music every day, make music day every year on June 21st. And even though it's not a holiday that we created, we wholeheartedly support it and we help make it big and here in Philadelphia because it's important to us that kids and, and adults reap the benefits of playing music. That's so cool. It doesn't have to be yours, but you can latch onto it, still promote it because yeah. it still helps the cause. I like that. Yes. You're not, uh, you're not closed minded. You're, you're infinite minded as Simon Sinek would say, but how do you tell me, how do you go from, from an idea to five years later being partnered with 750 plus organizations? What is that? What does that look like? If someone was just trying to work on building their partnerships, you know, how do you how do you make that happen? What are those first steps? Well, I have to tell you, there's a little bit of carpal tunnel involved. And I'm holding up my wrist so you can see. And not just for me, but my wife, our partner, uh, co-founder for Keep Music Alive. Uh, we literally now reach out to uh, about 5,000 music schools and music stores and other music organizations individually, individual emails two times for each of the music holidays. So four times a year, inviting them to participate. And we do it this way, number one, because we can't just throw all their emails into a database and spam them, <laughs> number one. <laughs> well, we could, but you know, number one, we're not supposed to. And number two, you don't get as good a response as if you personalize each email and really you know, reach out to them. 
Uh, and even then, you know, these music schools, music stores, the people that run them, that own them, they're very busy folks. I mean, they're handling their staff, they're handling their students, uh, they're handling their students' parents. You know, they're dealing with all these different factors. Uh, and we're trying to throw some, one more thing on top of their plate. Even though it seems simple to us, you know, it's like they're just so busy. They don't often don't want to hear about anything else. But through, you know, continually reaching out to them, we build up a cadre of now over 750 that each year participate with us and are even now starting to get in some of the chains, you know, the guitar centers, the music and arts, the school of rocks that are getting behind it. Uh, and it didn't happen overnight. You know, Rome wasn't built in a day. I, I didn't make that quote, but it's a good one. <laughs> But it, it's good to know because you, so you send out 5,000 emails four times a year. Or so you send out 20,000 emails a year promoting your two events and you handwrite every new custom craft them for each individual because custom emails get a better response yes. and through your 20,000 a year for five years, which is a hundred thousand emails, you have 750 partners. So if you're someone listening to this, it takes time, energy, effort, and a whole lot of repetition before you start yes. building the partnerships you need. Yes, but and you start with the template, and we have an email template that we start with. So there's just a couple of you know quick customizations you do to the template, you know, in the subject line, the 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 hello line, and then inside the email. So it so it, it appears more to them that you're actually writing to them individually, and you're making a personal connection with them. And if it's someone that you also happen to know and you build up a relationship with, you include something in there, you know that's related to that, that, you know, you know who they are, they know who you are and you're continually building this relationship. And you're right. It does take a whole lot of time, a whole lot of effort. Uh, and we're now only starting to bring on volunteers and even some paid people to help with those emails. Uh, you know, cause my wife's risk can only risk can only take so much. <laughs> uh, and I can only do so much working another job that helps pay for, you know, the roof and the food that we all enjoy day to day. Yeah, I definitely eat in three times a day. It's it's kind of one of my priorities. <laughs> I'm good with twice a day, and my wife yells at me for it. But you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do? Uh, but you have you have all these people that you're, that you're you're interacting with. I'm sure you get some replies, but it's not just a direct reply. Yep, we're signing up for it. We're doing it. But you go, I imagine, a long time with you. You get a lot of rejections, or you just get silence. How do you handle yeah. this silence? Silence is a very cool thing because what silence can teach us is that it's not what we think it is. So many times, how many times I'm sure you've experienced this, Travis, where, you know, you reach out to someone, you're looking for help, you're trying to answer a question, seeing if they might want to work with you for any capacity. You send out the email and what comes back? Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. So you're thinking, you know, we start to invent things in our head, create ideas of why is that? Uh, they don't really like me. Uh, I said something funny to them, you know, when I last when I saw them in person, and now you know they don't want to they don't want to respond, or they hate the idea, or whatever. Uh, but honestly, you know, no response could be it got stuck in their stamp, spam folder. Uh, the cyber police, you know, hung it up and it never even got to them at all. Uh, maybe they saw the email, but they were really busy that day. And now it's, you know, scrolling down to the bottom of their inbox. Uh, they could have really liked the idea and they're waiting to discuss it with their, you know, their partners or their coworkers to see if it's something they want to do. So many reasons, you know, why you've got nothing back. So we can't invent, you know, reasons in our head, <laughs> just like we invent, you know, fear in our head. We can't invent reasons in our head of why uh, they haven't responded. So what do you do? You wait seven, 10 days, send it again. You know, you, you, you know, do you forward the original email and just say, hey, I'm just checking in to see if you receive this. Let me, let us know if you have any questions. We'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, and then see what happens. Nothing happens. Wait another couple of weeks, try again. Uh, I have a really funny story about this. Uh, so for Kids Music Day, you know, we got the idea a couple of years ago that we should really reach out to celebrities and see if they might like to be you know, ambassadors for Kids Music Day. So, you know, we made a list of celebrities we would really like to connect with and we, you know, we reach out. And actually, the part I'm leaving out is we had actually started doing celebrity reach outs three years earlier for the book. 
uh, trying to get stories for the book. And, you know, there were many celebrities we reached out to that we heard nothing. You know, we had reached out to them two, three, four times over three years because we're doing a follow-up book and absolutely nothing. Uh, so and one of those happened to be uh, Julie Andrews. We all know the iconic, you know, actress, performer, singer, Julie Andrews. And so what did my wife decide to do? You know, you know, she could have decided, you know, we've never heard from her people. I'm just tired of writing to them. I'm not going to write again. But no, we just try again. Sometimes it takes proposing something different. Maybe Julie Andrews people weren't interested in having her even consider, you know, submitting a story or a quote for the book series. But you come back to them again with a different idea. And I'll tell you, this picture is still in my mind, you know, this image of one morning we get up out of bed, I go over to the bathroom. Uh, I'm trying not to get too visual here, right? And, you know, and then I'm facing my wife who's just slowly getting out of bed and she's picking up, you know, you pick up your phone in the morning and you start to look at your emails. She practically jumps out of bed. Oh my God, Julia Andrews people said yes. She would love to be a Kids Music Day ambassador. I nearly, <laughs> fell, off, I nearly fell off the toilet, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're the- getting visual here. Yeah. You know, in the future, you could say you're doing your morning routine. But <laughs> that's great. That's amazing. You have that, uh, I think you mentioned the pre-interview, pay, uh, polite persistence to keep yes. asking. And keep asking. You know, and isn't it true that that sometimes people will not support brand new organizations? They want to know that you're going to do it again a year in and year out, and you're going to you know use the material over and over and over. It, I, we talked also in the preview about about time wasting. Uh, for those of you that weren't around during the pre-interview, because I'm not going to air that, uh, that that section of it, we had some technical difficulties getting set up and connecting and doing some settings and stuff. That is not what I mean by time wasting. That's that's not wasting my time, right? That absolutely is not. We well, you know something I might waste my time is is setting up an interview, you know, no call, no show, and then reaching out a few weeks later to reschedule and you do it again. And I've had a few of those people I've ended up interviewing, and I'm so glad that I I waited for all uh, all the slog to get through with all the, the difficulties and 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 things that happened. And you know, I had to cancel a bunch of interviews because I just flew back to the states. I had about a week's week's prep time and I wasn't sure if we're going to be, I wasn't even sure we're going to be able to do this interview, but we tried to keep it on the books and see if we could make it happen. And here we are today making it happen. And and I appreciate, you know, Vincent for his flexibility. I'm sure he appreciates mine, but you have to, you have to keep pushing politely, right? Um, You're not, you you can't assume what the reason for rejection was, or if they even again saw the email or maybe it wasn't the right time in their life. Maybe they had a huge thing going on and they just couldn't dedicate the resources to it. And instead of, you know, giving you a big reason, they just let it go without a reply. Happens all the time, happens all the time. And the quote that I like to leave people with on that particular topic is quite simply, silence never means no. Now, my wife will, you know, sometimes disagree with me on that. It's not that it never means no. You know, it could mean no, but I don't know. I'm sticking with silence never means no, because that's what, you know, gives me the impetus to keep trying until somebody writes you back and says, I'm definitely not interested. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I assume no. And even when they say I'm definitely not interested, it just means Not now. (laughs) Not yet. You have absolute permission to go back six months, a year later, and pitch them again with the same idea, maybe a little bit of a twist to it, maybe a new idea. Look at what you've accomplished over the last year that you're bringing to the table, you and your organization with your programs, and you might just, maybe that person you're requesting is now is in a different place. So many different reasons why they might say yes the next time. So don't write people off just because they said no the first time. Where did you go to find all this contact information for these teams of people and for their celebrities and all this? Initially, we're turn, turning to Dr. Google, and uh, you know that's one great resource uh, to find. You know, you're looking for their managers, for their agents, for their publicists. Those are kind of like their three main people on their team that you have a shot of getting a response to, response from because they have some connection, close connection with the artist. Uh, but the other place besides Google is we actually paid for a service called Contact Any Celebrity where for $200 a year, you can, you know, get 
names and addresses and email addresses and phone numbers from, you know, for the agents, the publicists, the managers, for literally thousands and thousands of celebrities. Now, keep in mind that information is always, you know, being updated. So, you know, what we've generally found is, you know, the information that we had there is generally about 70% up to date. So it's not always perfect, but it saves you a lot of time and effort in connecting with people. And often when you reach out to someone, if they're the wrong person, sometimes they're nice enough to come back and say, actually, so-and-so is now the right person for this artist, you know, contact them and they'll just, you know, lead you to the right person, you know, which is awesome. That's really nice of them. And you, you know, and, and there you have a relationship. You're starting with this agent or manager or publicist and you write back to them telling them how appreciative you are of their response and, you know, giving you some up-to-date information. And you never know, that person may help you out again later with an artist that they are currently working with. So it's like everything else, Travis. It's about building relationships. It takes time. It takes patience. It takes politeness. It takes being human. Oh, and it takes asking because if you don't ask, it's a guaranteed no. That's right. Everything we ever didn't ask for didn't happen. Well, that's not totally true. <laughs> <laughs> that's not but totally you get the idea. <laughs> totally true, but it wouldn't look half bad on a t-shirt. Right. <laughs> We're going to listen back to this and get some more t-shirts going. Oh, absolutely. Uh, speaking of that, since since Vincent brought it up, if you go to reallydesigns.biz, you can find nonprofit architect t-shirts with quotes from all the guests. And if you found a t-shirt or a quote that you want that's not on a t-shirt, let me know. Connect with me on Facebook or send me an email to nonprofitarchitect at gmail.com. And we'll throw that quote on a t-shirt for you so you can have it. That's awesome. And what's the URL again? Reallydesigns.biz. B-I-Z. Reallydesigns.biz. All right. You heard it here first, people. (laughs) <laughs> I understand oh, yeah. you were trying to connect with them and you're trying to set up your store. Yes, absolutely. Cause we are behind in the whole having a store thing. It's I, I tell you what, it, you know, you're, you're working on doing it um, for this particular company, David and Ginger are, are military veterans and they do all the work. They do all the design work. They put the logo, the phrase, the whatever you want on a t-shirt they put a mock-up online. They give you the link. They handle all the payment. They create the T-shirt. They ship it direct to customer. It's zero dollars out of pocket for you. If you come up with a design and it never sells, they're out. You know, twenty minutes putting it on a on a website. You don't have to order a thousand. There's no minimum buy and none of that garbage. And you don't even have to add it to your website right away. You can promote it just on your social media. So it's really flexible in in what you can do with that. And it's important, I think, I know, to have, you know, branded items that we can offer to our supporters because some people just really like to support by buying a T-shirt, buying a hat or whatever it is, uh, because it's one way that, you know, they have a token of showing. It's like a uh, souvenir from their favorite organization they like to support. Yeah, well, then it gives them a chance to brag on, you know, what great things the organization is doing and how they help take part in, in building what they're doing. It helps show that ownership. It's just like an, an NFL team up until five years ago, they were a nonprofit. And you better believe that, you know, whatever part of the country you're in, I don't know if you're an Eagles fan and we're, you know, Philly, Philly gear, but <laughs> that was all going towards their nonprofit. You're just walking around promoting the team. You're letting other people, you're letting your, your biggest fans promote your organization for you. And they paid yeah. to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's most brilliant mar- most brilliant art marketing idea ever have other people pay you to put your message out there and for a nonprofit that is just an ideal way to go about it yeah i know there's there's still that stigma out there that says that you know people using services of a nonprofit shouldn't have to pay anything and that's just not true at all very very successful nonprofits charge for everything they do but the only real thing you have to do to meet a nonprofit is follow the rules and have a mission and everything has to go towards the mission. All the profits get pumped back in towards the mission and the organization, not to the shareholders like a regular business. Right. You just have to keep asking. You have a special term for asking. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We were talking about that a little while ago. So really, you know, there's a, there's a study out there somewhere where it often takes four or five asks to make a sale 
on something or to convince somebody, you know, to come over to your side for an idea you're trying to present. So if you ask one time, two times, three times, you, you probably won't succeed on the odds. But the fourth or fifth time is when you really have the best chance of making that deal happen, that partnership happen. Uh, so we like to call being a person who likes to ask a lot and to continually ask an ask a holic. It sounds like a meeting you have to go to. I'm Travis. I'm an askaholic. I've been an askaholic my whole life. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, there should be a 12 step program for it, you know, which, you know, would be important. Uh, you know, basically, you know, we did, we need disciplines for all areas of our life, whether we're trying to overcome, you know, substance abuse or whether we're trying to promote a cause and trying to expand our disciplines, our personal disciplines, uh, to being able to increase our chances for succeeding. So learning how to ask, 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 and ask again is one key way to make that happen. Oh, absolutely. What do you guys do for Keep Music Alive to generate your income? We do a number of things. I mean, we do our own Facebook fundraising uh, events, which by events, I mean just creating an event on Facebook and putting a fundraiser attached to it and uh, asking our supporters to share and donate. Uh, We actually get a lot of people, supporters, some who we know, some who we don't know, that create their own Facebook fundraisers that help to support us. And we're extremely grateful for that. Uh, We write grants applications uh not as many as i would like to get out the door uh but we've been the fortunate recipient of several grants over the last couple of years uh since we formally became a nonprofit just about almost three years ago this october uh we do a couple of events each year uh most years uh we do a teach music week event in march which was unfortunately uh had to be canceled due to everything going on this past march where we have local music schools come and do performances we also started doing something last november uh, called sip saber and song where we it was a lot of a higher end event where we had classical performers opera performers jazz performers come and perform at a really cool venue uh and you know we raised some funds that way and we were looking forward we are looking forward to doing that again this november it may be a virtual event we're not really sure it's way too early to tell uh, but we're learning you know from some of our nonprofit brethren out there in the world you know ways to really maximize doing a virtual event uh it's well, I love, it just brings me, I have to say this, I love that you do this podcast. I love that you do what you're doing, Travis, because you're just helping us all share ideas with each other. And this is really how we learn because nobody knows it all. In fact, most of us know almost nothing when we start out. <laughs> we don't the ask. We know almost nothing, but they asked, they asked enough questions to make yes. it happen. And I have to tell you, I've been guilty in my lifetime of not for most of my lifetime, I've never asking enough questions. And it's only been in the last several years where I'm slowly turning my mentality into, you know, don't try to figure out to stop trying to figure out everything for myself and ask, be open to listening and learning from other people uh, and just expanding our own horizons because it, it's going to improve what it is that we're doing. And everything we're talking about with asking, you know, sometimes, you know, we're uncomfortable and asking people for things, asking for donations, asking for help with events, asking for volunteers. But as non as curators of our nonprofit mission, we have to come back and remember our why. Why are we doing this? And what is the reason you started this nonprofit? What is the reason that we're, you know, working engaged with this nonprofit? Uh, and when we really take that why deep into our heart, it makes asking for help so much easier because we're not asking for ourselves. We're asking for the cause. We're asking for the kids who we want to play music. We're asking for the people we know who need more food. We're asking for the people who we know who are ill that need medical help, treatments, whatever it is that our cause represents. When we really keep our focus on our why, why we are here and doing this, it really helps make the asking easier. Oh, absolutely. And I picked up on a little something that that you slipped in there that you said that you you started writing a book six years ago, but you'd only been a nonprofit for about three years. Yes. And I also heard you say that you can't be a professional, uh, you know, a perfectionist or professional proficient at everything that we have to reach out sometimes. So what does that, what does that look like for you? And what did, what did you do to, to actually get started? Well, it's funny. When we had the idea for the book, it was just going to be a book. 
uh, a book series. Oh, no, it was just going to be a book. The book series part came later. Uh, and then we had the idea for Teach Music Week. And somewhere along the line, we started realizing, you know what, this is becoming an actual organization uh, that we're calling Keep Music Alive. Uh, it's not a nonprofit. It's not even it's not even a corporation. It's not even I haven't filed with anybody for anything. I'm just making this stuff up. Uh, but over time, we were realizing, you know, this is really what we've created, you know, a cause based organization. Uh, and we really should, you know, create a nonprofit out of this, make it turn it into a nonprofit organization You do the formal steps so that we can, you know, benefit from what that will get us you know, in terms of a nonprofit. And I'll also have more, draw, be able to draw more supporters into what we're doing. Uh, but I'll tell you, Travis, sometimes I have this really big fear of doing things like, you know, hurdles, like, you know, I've heard the horror stories of how hard it is to become a nonprofit and the hoops you have to jump through and it takes, you know, months or sometimes years and it can be rejected and you have to apply again and all that. And I listened to all that and I put all these fears in my head and we actually, for probably a year or two, I said, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to do it until finally I'm like, all right, we really have to do this. This is important. <laughs> So, you know, I started reaching out to different professionals, to an accountant uh, who said that they, you know, could help, reached out to an attorney who said they could help, reached out to, I think, to another attorney who said they could help. Uh, it really wasn't going anywhere, else. meaning even people who said that they would help, you know, and then I said, okay, what do we need to get started? I'd wait a week or two, mm -hmm. back to them again, what do we need to do to get started? <laughs> It wasn't going anywhere, and I was just getting more and more frustrated. So finally, I put it out to the universe and asked, people, what did you do to start your nonprofit? Who did you work with? Please help. Put that out there online, and within a day came back the answer, well, this is what we did. And we fought, you know, they were awesome for us. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, you know, I'll name this organization in a minute. Uh, but from the time we picked up the phone and called them, had our little phone consult, uh, filled out the forms, which took another day. And by the time, from the time we hit submit on that application to this organization and the time we got the piece of paper back from the IRS said, here's your number, you're good. One month. Well, that's One good. month. That's I don't know if we, if we just hit like a good time in their cycle or what it was, but, you know, I almost fell over backwards. One month. And the company that we used for this was called, uh, I'm going to look down at my notes, Biz Central USA. That's B-I-Z Central USA. Now, they, they cater to both businesses and nonprofits. They have a whole section of employees that deal with helping nonprofits, not just with creating a nonprofit and going through all those steps, not only federally, but with the state that you're in. But they also have other resources to help you later on that you can partake of if, you, if you're interested. But we literally spent two, three hundred dollars uh, plus all the filing fees that were involved for the for the IRS and for the state. And this happened. And uh, why didn't I do it sooner? Fear. Don't let fear stop you, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let fear. Well, I mean, it's important to talk about using the professional service. I mean, you've been in the music industry forever. Did you ever try to like? do your own editing and your own production of the music that you wrote? That's shameful, Travis. Shameful, Travis. <laughs> yes. For many years, I would, you know, I'm a songwriter. I did recordings. I produced my own recordings. I mean, I would go to a studio, but I would play, I would play, in quotes, producer, <laughs> and, uh, you know, make call the shots and decide what would happen. And uh, one day, you know, after many years of doing this and realizing that my recordings were really subpar, uh, you know, I remember listening to another friend who had a demo. I'm like, who is doing your recordings? So she put me on to him and I went and visited, you know, made an appointment. I went to see him for two hours. We had, a, you know, we had a session. And in those two hours, my jaw was like, you know, I can't see it on the podcast, but my jaw was dropping. Uh, what he put together for me in two hours, I was like, my goodness, why didn't I not, why did I not contact you sooner? Uh, we did a full album together and I will one day, I have to dig up some of my old recordings to play you. Here's the before, <laughs> here's the after. The before well, sounds mean, like an amateur. The after sounds like it's on the radio. 
Well, it, it's, it's, it's funny that we talk about that. I mean, I, I offer uh, consulting and coaching services for nonprofits that are looking, looking to get a little stronger. Um, there's a lot of people that I turn down cause I don't, uh, there's, you know, feelings not right. Uh, we're not vibing we're on the same page. They don't, they don't take advice. So you say, ask a holic. That means you got to keep asking over and over and over again. And I say, ask hole that they ask for your advice and then they never take it. And after, you know, after, after two of those, they try to ask me again. I'm just I'm not interested because that, that's wasting my time. That's something that I, I try not to do. If anyone's going to waste my time, it's going to be me. Or I'm not going to let anyone else do it. <laughs> I, I'm perfectly capable of wasting my own time. I don't need that <laughs> in that particular category. Um, and if you want to work with me, shoot me an email, nonprofitarchitect at gmail.com. Uh, we'll build up a proposal, see if we can find something that works for you. And it's, that's going to meet our needs. Or I'm going to refer you to uh, you know, one of my teammates that I know can help you in that area. It, it's, it's not about me. It's about making those around me stronger and those around me better and, and, and getting better as a team and getting better as a community and getting better as, you know, not that small minded USA, but that, that, that whole world getting that tide to rise all boats. Right. My, you just said, hinted on one of our favorite quotes that we put out there everywhere, you know, to other music and arts nonprofits. And that is quite simply, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. We're all in this together. We're not competing with each other. You know, when I help to amplify your message, it's helping to amplify the cause that I care about as well. You know, we can trade ideas. We learn from each other. Uh, there are lots, you know, you have, we have to start creating the abundance mindset, you know, for ourselves where there are pl- so many people out there that have never donated or helped to support a cause. Mm-hmm. So our, our mission is to go out there to collectively define those people that have the resources, both time and financial that could be helping us collectively and are not helping our causes collectively and convincing them to come on board to help grow what we're trying to grow, what we're all standing for. Uh, that's that's fantastic and I, I love the mission i love the vision uh i hope great things keep happening for keep music alive and you get more and more celebrity ambassadors for teach music week and kids music day what is the best place for people to contact you vincent probably the best way to start uh is uh, our website which is keep music org. Uh, and from there, you can get to Kids Music Day. You can get to Teach Music Week. You can also find us on the social channels. Uh, just if you put in Keep Music Alive on Facebook, we'll come right up. Same thing with Twitter and Instagram. Uh, we're slowly but surely building those presences up. It's taken a while, and we still have a long ways to go. Uh, but I'm very happy that now when you put our name in, we come in, we come up pretty much on top every time. Uh, yeah, SEO, search engine optimization, is a very vital that's the success of business nowadays. But I tell you what, Vincent, it was great talking to you. I'm glad we could make this work today. I know you got uh, family. You finally get to see some family after after three months. Uh, yes. Like my family after a year. <laughs> so I'm going to let you go and enjoy them. Uh, and thank you so much for coming on today. You've been listening to The Nonprofit Architect. To listen to all our past shows, visit http colon forward slash forward slash nonprofitarchitect.org. And be sure to subscribe, rate, and review our show. Thank you.